this is Nikhil Rampal and you're watching The Print.in where we talk about politics, policy, government and governance. And in this video, we are going to talk about women at work. If you look at the statistics of India's labor force, you'd find that less than one third of women in the working age group in India are actually employed in economic activities. And this low participation rate has prevailed for decades. In fact, the situation is so grim that the World Economic Forum has placed India eight ranks below Saudi Arabia in its Gender Gap Index Report 2022. Why has this been the case for so long? Where are we falling behind? Uh, are we making any progress in this regard? And what changes, both from policy and society uh, perspective, do we expect to ameliorate the situation? Well, to discuss these things with me, I have great experts, Dr. Ashwini Desh Pandey, Director of Ashoka University's Center for Economic Data and Analysis, SEDA, and Dhruvika Dameja, a pre-doctoral fellow at the same center, who, whose recent study on women, uh, women in factories caught our attention. Uh, you can read the story in the description box below. And both of you, Dr. Ashwini and Dhruvika, welcome to the print. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, so, Dhruvika, uh, my first question is towards your research that you published recently. Your research shows that the share of women in India's uh, factories has remained unchanged at 19% for the past two decades. However, it also shows that in southern India, this is little less than around 50%. What do you think keeps the northern Indian women uh, away from working in factories? Yeah, so uh, that, that was the main finding of the research. Um, and uh, what, uh, what I don't have a clear answer for this, but one thing is that Tamil Nadu is the most industrialized state, for example, in the country, um, and it does have the largest number of factories in the country. Um, and it's also, um, you know, um, it's also historically, uh, it's perhaps the industrial structure uh, in the state that is more favorable to women. For example, in the same research, I also point out that there are certain industries that women are more likely to be a part of. So it is probably the case that uh, those industries, like for example, the garment industry is uh, rife in Tamil Nadu, but that's just like a part of the explanation. That's not the entire explanation because for example, Maharashtra and Gujarat also have large number of garment manufacturing units. So yes, it's pretty surprising that Tamil Nadu has been able to do so well. Uh, so there must be something in the industrial uh, policy of the state that is working for women. Uh, and I'd like to pass this on to Professor Desh Pande, who will be able to answer this question better. Sure, sure. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the uh, what Dhruvika's study uh, and our study shows basically is that this these are the broad facts. And I think now is the time to deep dive into particular issues what has Tamil Nadu or in general southern states, what have they done in order to make sure that women are able to travel to these factories and get, gain employment? So one is, as Dhruvika said, is the industrial structure. The other important part is that women's ability to travel to jobs, if they existed, is severely constrained uh, because of the lack of transportation, the lack of supportive services, uh, which, uh, you know, if women are predominantly responsible for domestic work, even if there's work available in the factory, they will not be able to access it. Or if there's no transportation, they will not be able to access it and so on. So it would now be uh, very pertinent to do a follow-up study to see in which of these dimensions Tamil Nadu does better. But I think that the major part of the explanation mm -hmm. is the fact that these, these industries that are labor-intensive Mm -hmm. and have a higher female share exist in states like in, in, in Tamil Nadu. Um, and and you, you don't really find that, for example, in North India, in UP mm -hmm. and Bihar particularly, mm -hmm. the proportion of women in uh, factory amongst factory workers is dismally low and has been the case. So is there a relationship and, between the number of factories and the share of participation? Like no, it's not so direct because it's a question of sectors also. Mm -hmm. So when you look at labor intensive industries for example food and uh, food and food processing apparel tobacco um uh, leather mm. uh, garments you know mm. these are factories that are typically labor intensive mm. and these labor intensive factories typically have or used to have mm. higher shares of female workers relative to male but so it's not just the number of factories it's also the question of sector 
and where the factories are located. Yeah. This brings us to our next question. What role do you think gender stereotypes play in deciding the diversity of employment choices of women, uh, specifically in the rural areas? So the in rural areas, the predominant um, avenue for women uh, is really agriculture and allied industries. So agriculture, you know, livestock, fisheries, forests, etc. So one of the things that we at CEDA uh, have been continuously uh, arguing is that we need to increase avenues of rural non-farm employment, which is labor intensive, which is close to home, which women can access easily. And it's also it also pays more than the sort of very, uh, you know, uh, low paying, vulnerable, uh, seasonal kind of agricultural employment. Um, uh, Dhruvika, you've seen the uh, variation in the states, right? So what are the states that have the lowest, uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about that in terms of the lowest uh, share of factory workers. By the way, for the listeners, let me emphasize that this study, what it's giving you are numbers of women and men employed in factories as direct workers. So A, this is about blue collar work. B, this is about the formal sector work. Hmm. And this doesn't include contract employees. So we, we need to keep all these caveats in man, mind when we uh, look at the data. Sure. Yeah, so uh, what the study finds is that uh, what the ASI data shows, for example, is that uh, of all women working in uh, formal uh, manufacturing sector in the country, 72% of women, they're working in just uh, some industries. So these are the industries of textile, apparel, leather, food and tobacco industries. For example, tobacco industry is the only industry where the share of female workers is higher than the share of male workers. So some 73% of all workers in the tobacco industry are women. Apart from that, apparel has a 50-50 share. Uh, but in the rest of the um, uh, industries, uh, the share of male employment is much higher than the share of uh, uh, female employment. Yeah, so really what uh, this is showing is that there is some kind of horizontal uh, gender segregation that is at play uh, at the industry level. And this might be showing that there are limited uh, opportunities that are available to women in the manufacturing sector. So which are the extreme uh, you know, states which have the lowest uh, percentage of women in factories? Like if you could list out some numbers, like this state has X percent, which is one of the lowest in the country. So uh, Chhattisgarh has the lowest, it's uh, around 3% and it's followed by Delhi uh, at some 4%, um, West Bengal and uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, overall, I think there are 10 states that have their shares lower than uh, 10%, the share of female employment at lower than 10%. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this brings us to our next question. On one side, we have low number of women at work and your research shows that they're also paid much below than their male counterparts on average. So does that motivate uh, demotivate women to join workplaces? What role do you think an equal pay for the same work uh, can have? Yeah, so uh, yeah, yes, the wage gap exists, but uh, it should be noted that uh, uh, it is likely that the wage gap in informal industries is much higher. So, for example, in the article, I cite a Harvard paper that shows uh, that the wage gap in informal industries is actually much higher. The ASI data only uh, pertains to the organized or the formal manufacturing in India. So these are factories that are registered uh, under the Factories Act. And so they have to comply with certain labor laws, certain uh, legislations pertaining to security or social security of the workers. So these are actually some of the better jobs in the sector. And um, um, workers are actually looking to be a part of the formal manufacturing sector. So we do find a wage gap, uh, but we also caveat it by saying that we don't know if this is simply gender discrimination or it could it could be that uh, it could be a difference in the kind of work that men and women workers do. It could be a difference in skills or education of uh, men and women workers. And because ASI does not have that kind of data, so we are not uh, been able to find the cause of the gender gap. But there is research that suggests that women are often in the lower ends of the hierarchy at workplaces and they're usually working in uh, you know lower skilled jobs and so they're making low uh, incomes 
so really it's a question of uh, you know skilling and being able to move up the ladder for women yeah i i just like to add to this to say mm. that um, when we talk about equal work for equal pay mm. uh, or equal pay for equal work rather um what we are what asi data doesn't allow you to do is to separate workers by skill level or by occupation level within the sector mm. and then see whether men and women are earning differently it just mm. gives you average wages for women and average wages for for male workers so supposing women are you know to what dhruvika was saying is that supposing women are working in the low paying occupations within the sector mm -hmm. and men are disproportionately in the high paying occupations within the sector mm -hmm. then is the gender segregation in occupations that is producing the wage gap so it's not this it's not that they are being being paid differently for the same work mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that could happen but this we don't know uh, uh, whether this showing that it could just be occupational segregation where men are concentrated at the top of the occupational ladder and women are disproportionately concentrated at the bottom of the occupational ladder that could be producing these differences but i i don't want to step back uh, nikhil and just point out that we have had an earlier data narrative where we've talked about employment in the manufacturing sector as a whole which has fallen drastically in the last 5 years so this data narrative is about the male and female employees in the factory sector which is in manufacturing obviously but the larger pro the larger issue in india uh, mm -hmm. in addition to the male female gaps is the fact that manufacturing share in total employment has been falling mm -hmm. drastically uh, not just because of covid but even pre covid and i think that's an issue that directly impinges on the availability of jobs for women as well so when we talk of female labor force participation mm -hmm. we also have to talk about availability of jobs that women can do if those are falling mm -hmm. uh, and then if women are willing to work there are jobs that women can do so i think we have to link both issues together so uh, the research shows that women are also more likely to be working in a handful of industries uh, while male employment is more diversified do we have some gender gaps on to which like which are the industries where women women's participation is the least compared to men like the ratio is extremely skewed apart from apparel of course like you mentioned that women are present more in apparel which are the sectors that women are not visible in and that that they could be you know, surely visible some 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 time soon sure. so for example motor vehicles is a large uh, employer of men so like some uh lakhs of men are employed in motor vehicles but if you see the number for women it's in thousands and the same is the case for most industries so like machinery is another one chemicals is another one so their shares are lower than 10% in all industries except these leather uh textile and so forth okay so uh ashwini ma'am if we move out of the factories right the picture is still dim more than two thirds of working age women in this country are not in workplaces or formal workplaces uh, how do you think india has responded to this particular statistic and uh, what, when was the last time we heard about a reform in bringing women to work and how many more reforms do you think we need to address this problem well i mean the good news is that at least in the policy circles this issue is being discussed hmm. um so at least there's recognition of the problem the latest economic survey has talked about the methodology of you know women's role in economic activities mm -hmm. which are not always paid because they are family enterprises like farming or livestock or fisheries which the farm family is doing got kirana stores or things like that mm -hmm. so women contribute their labor to these enterprises but while the men on these enterprises are counted as workers women are not counted as workers that is the issue of measurement and for the first time the economic survey of the government of india this time in 2023 mm -hmm. has paid attention to that question and tried to revise the estimate of female labor force participation which is uh, according to their revision is now at 46% but we must re recognize that this shift from 30 to 46 or 28 to 46 whichever one you believed earlier mm -hmm. is not reflecting women's participation in paid employment it is just recognizing their unpaid contribution to economic activities in the family and that must be recognized mm -hmm. however the bigger problem of women being in paid employment 
and utilizing their full productive potential, which need not be family enterprises. They could be anything. That issue remains. And I think our work in, at CEDA, including this particular study, mm -hmm. highlights the issue of not enough avenues mm -hmm. for women. I know that the bulk of the consensus in the academic literature is about social norms. Mm -hmm. uh, and th there are many norms that need to change. I'll be the first to admit that. But I think that the, the, the cycle needs to be broken at the point of provision of jobs. When women get out and start working in paid employment, norms mm -hmm. will have to shift. It is impossible for the current norms to exist. And we've seen that historically in all other countries in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, women were not historically in, in paid employment. They, they got into it. And uh, as a result of women getting into paid employment, norms started to change, whether it's sun preference, whether it's foot binding, whether it's you know thinking of women as the primary providers of, of uh, domestic uh, you know, work, et cetera. All these norms, the needle has shifted. And I think in India, it can shift too, provided we we have uh, opportunities. So think of you know the fact that women's dramatically increased in the last de two decades. You know, the male-female gaps in education levels are more or less now, you know, non-existent. Non so women are educated, they are smart, they have aspirations, yes. but they don't have avenues for, for productive employment to the extent that they should have. Hmm. And and what reforms do are we looking at in order to address this, both from society and policy perspective? I mean, if you're asking me, my uh, sort of, if you needed just one answer from me, that would be expand avenues for rural, non-farm, labor-intensive employment, which will be open for both men and women. It's not just for female. And so it's, mm -hmm. we are not talking about beauty parlors and you know uh, yes. stitching classes, not that, just all kinds of work, uh, which for example, China did or East Asian uh, economies did, mm -hmm. where people can work in rural areas in non-agricultural employment, which is labor intensive. So it's not super high productivity kind of employment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's labor intensive, but it gives gainful work. Mm -hmm. And it also reduces the pressure on cities because now nowadays if you want any well-paying job, the only option is to move to the cities, but that need not be so. You know, rural areas can be used as sites of rural non-farm manufacturing. Mm. And that, to my mind, will generate a sort of a virtuous cycle. Mm. Families in rural India will also get used to the fact that women can work not just on the farms, family farms, but on other things as well. Um, and um, uh, it eases the pressures on, on cities and the high high tech, uh, non-labor intensive, uh, you know, work can be done in the cities as you know, and gradually, you know, these these things have a momentum of their own. So okay. 20, 30 years of this can then eventually shift things in a way that you see in China okay. or in East Asia. But to begin with, okay. uh, I think we have to, first of all, we have to recognize that we are a labor surplus country. Yes. I mean, that's a fact, you know, so we talk about the demographic dividend. At the moment, it's not a dividend because people are not gainfully employed. But to generate the dividend, to, to increase GDP, you know, we need to utilize the harness, the productive potential of, of our people, in youth, women, you know, sections that are not gainfully employed right now. And uh, because we are a labor surplus country, we have to think of how to utilize surplus labor. Hmm. And uh, that has to be, uh, you know, the starting point has to be rural non-farm employment. Now, what do you think uh, work from home conditions or hybrid working regimes can provide to our women's participation at work? See, these are applicable to a very small segment of female work. So people like Dhruvika and me, we can work from home because our work is... You know, I mean, even I can't actually because I'm a teacher. So I, you know, beyond a point, I can't work from home. But hypothetically, Dhruvika could work from home. In fact, she was working from home and uh, COVID was raging. Uh, so, but there are very few uh, um, jobs of, if you look at the total spectrum of employment that allows uh, work from home of the kind that we think. Home-based workers is something that women have always been whether it is you know, making those bindika packets or matchsticks or agarbattis and things like that. This is very poorly paid, very uh, you know, highly vulnerable uh, contract-based job that you know, work that women do for a pittance. Mm. You know, so when you, when you make 1,000 key rings, you'll get one rupee or something like that. I mean, it's, I, I'm just, you know, this number is not to be quoted, but I'm just saying that this is highly, uh, very poorly paid, often very exploitative work which women do on the side while they are when they are doing so that is 
also quote unquote work from home, but not in the same way that we in the middle class think of work from home. So I think that one thing that COVID has done is to show employers mm -hmm. in the formal sector of the work of the kind that you and I do, Nikhil, where we can possibly work from home. Mm -hmm. It has shown them that work can be done from home. And to the extent that it destigmatizes women's uh, women, that's a good thing. But we should not think of this as a solution mm -hmm. to women's labor force participation rate because uh, uh, large kinds, you know, ours is still a predominantly informal workforce. 90% of India's workforce is in the informal sector. Yes. So when you think of agriculture, daily wages, you know, construction work, selling things on the on the footpath, things like that. This is not work. It's not possible. This is not, you have to go to the workplace to work. Uh, you know, so while in the, in the middle class, upper middle class, we must allow for work from home when possible, but that can't be the solution. Okay. So work from home technically is not the solution to bridge India's gender gap. I mean, even, even teaching, you know, we did teach from home when, when COVID was raging, mm -hmm. but I think there's greater recognition that, that the learning that you can get from teaching on online is very different from the learning that you get from being, being in present. And even, uh, you know, CEDA staff, they were all working from home, but it was isolating. Yes. You have no colleagues, there's no social interaction, there's nobody to talk to, you know, so beyond a point, you know, working from office or working from the workplace mm -hmm. uh, also has advantages, not just disadvantages. Yes. And so while we must allow for hybrid, um, we must also recognize that we need, you know, there is a, there is a certain advantage to work and work, working from office. In any case, it's not a solution. <laughs> That's okay. all I'm trying to say. But really? however, if women, you know, if this was the condition, mm -hmm. Uh, that a woman would say, okay, I can take up this job, but you must allow me to work from home. Mm. I think employers should be more flexible about that. Okay. Dhrubika, one question to you, and then we'll come to the concluding part. So uh, your research also showed that women are overrepresented in the unorganized sector. Could you elaborate on how, how, is, it, how is it happening? Yeah, so as Professor Deshpande pointed out, that 90% of uh, economic activity in India is of the informal kind. And in the article, I cite an estimate that says 80% of manufacturing also is in the unorganized or informal sector. So if you look at the total employment of women, uh, there is a larger share of employment that is, again, in the informal or unorganized uh, sector. So what that means is, as compared to men, women are more likely to be uh, a part of the unorganized um, sector. And uh, this, this is based on the uh, periodic labor force survey data. Uh, and the PLFS, for example, for also shows that uh, of all the women that are a part of the workforce in 2020-21, uh, some 59% were self-employed and, and some one-third are working as unpaid helpers in the uh, household enterprises. So this kind of pervasiveness of uh, self-employment really shows that there is a lack of regular formal work uh, available to women and uh, Apart from this, um, there's also, um, yeah, like, I think that's it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Self-employment is a sort of a, you know, a blanket term. Hmm. It covers everything. So self-employment can be entrepreneurial, high productivity activities. But somebody who's just literally going onto the street and looking for a daily wage job, that is also called can be, you know, just, or selling some, you know, tea on the road uh, roadside or selling flowers or something like that. That's also self-employment, but that's very, very precarious, very vulnerable, very low paying. Uh, you know, it's just, you do something to get by basically. That's also self-employment. So I think what Dhrubika is trying to say is that 90% of our workforce is in, um, uh, you know, in the informal sector, 10% of the workforce is in the formal sector. And for reasons that we just discussed earlier, women, um, because of the predominant responsibility of domestic work, but also the lack of, uh, you know, formal sector opportunities for them, they end up doing, you know, survivalist, low productivity, informal jobs. And also they work on agriculture. Agriculture is the biggest employer of women. Mm. Uh, and that is all informal, right? Mm. So you work on family farms, you work on, you know, allied activities like livestock, etc. So if there's if, if there is a rural family with animals, mm. that family would be a livestock farm 
livestock farming would be their activity who takes care of the animals mm. it's a woman you know uh, yeah. it's uh, livestock farmers are predominantly women but the activity could be the worker mm. recognition goes to the man or the head of the household not to the woman who's actually doing the work you know so this brings us to a concluding question to ashwini ma'am because uh, you you are an expert on this subject and economics of course so uh, keeping other things constant or citrus paribus as the famous uh, assumption goes in economics um uh, if today india's female uh, labor participation rate was at a desirable level say whatever the participation rate of males is there had it been the same case for women how much of the gdp or how much output is india missing out on not having the minute work yeah so these are you know obviously these are estimates and there's no because because it's hypothetical but yeah. i mean i don't know i uh, you know different people make different assumptions and do that but i mean you could easily think of uh, you know a 30% increase or something like that 25% increase in india's gdp if everything else were the same and just women's contribution went up in mm -hmm. paid so i think india is missing out uh, on a, on a potential to be a really much bigger economy than mm. it is currently because mm. its women are not involved in productive work to the extent that they can be or they should be or they would like to be hmm okay so i think this brings us towards the end of our conversation um uh, thank you so much professor ashwin desh pande and dhuvika for this intriguing conversation and insights on the state of women participation at work by the way ashoka university center of economic uh, data and analysis has recently launched an initiative to address india's plunging female labor force participation so we are expecting a series of more insightful in depth research on issues around women at work uh, stay tuned and thank you for tuning into this special broadcast and keep watching the print.in thank you thank you so much.